Good evening and a very special welcome to all of you to this wonderful evening of thought-provoking discussion here at UBC's spectacular Chan Centre for the Performing Arts, located on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nation. My name is Barbara Miles and I have the pleasure of being the Vice President, Development and Alumni Engagement here at UBC. As you just saw in our centennial video, which by the way I've seen about 900 times and I still love it, UBC is proud to mark its 100th anniversary as a global leader in education. It is in fact now one of the top six public universities in North America. Well, I hope some of you had a chance to attend the UBC 100 What's Next talks this afternoon at our brand new Robert H. Lee Alumni Center. We heard from four prominent alumni, Rick Hansen about the future of accessibility, Sapora Berman on the future of the planet, Miru Dalwala about the future of food sources, and Elizabeth Croft, an alumna and faculty member about the future of robotics. I hope you're all now ready for even more stimulation as we continue to peer into the future and see the importance of living a life driven by curiosity. But before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the estate of Kitty Heller for their generous contribution for making all the talks today possible at UBC 100 What's Next. And also a big thank you to our key sponsors for the day without whom it could not have happened. And they are our affinity partners, TD Insurance, Melosh Monex, Manu Life, and Worldwide Quest. And our media partners, the Georgia Strait, the TIE, Van City Buzz, and Glacier Media. The entire day, in conjunction with the graduation ceremonies here at the Okanagan campus and here at UBC Vancouver, marks the closing, sadly, of UBC's year-long centennial celebrations. This month specifically marks 100 years since the first class of 40 students became UBC's first alumni on May the 4th, 1916. Over the last century, UBC has graduated more than 307,000 alumni, and I'm proud to introduce one of those alumni tonight. As your moderator for the evening, our illustrious alumna, Fiona Forbes. Fiona is a well-known face in broadcasting here in BC and has always been a strong ambassador for her alma mater. I know she's had many fascinating assignments in her broadcasting career, but I'm willing to bet none quite like the one you're about to witness tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome UBC alumna Fiona Forbes. <laughs> It's like they know me playing Justin Timberlake as I come in. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, everyone, for the warm welcome uh, tonight. I know that you're as excited as I am. Well, maybe I'm more excited. I have to say, when I got the call a few weeks ago uh, from my good friend Fred Lee at the UBC Alumni Association, he asked, if I would like to come to the Chan Center and moderate a Q&A with Mr. William Shatner, I think I screamed yes before he even finished talking. So it is an absolute honor and pretty much a geek dream to be here tonight because I'm such a huge fan of Mr. Shatner as I'm sure everyone is here as well tonight. As Barbara mentioned, I graduated not a hundred years ago. I wasn't one of the first grads. I graduated in 93 with a Bachelor of Arts, which led me to my career in television. And I currently host a show called Fiona Forbes on Shaw TV, so I wouldn't forget what it was called. Because I'm only smart sometimes. <laughs> anyway, you are not here tonight to hear about me. You came here tonight to hear from William Shatner about the importance of living a life driven by curiosity. Curiosity is key, especially at one of the top six public universities in North America, as Barbara just said. 
As students, we have the freedom to indulge our curiosity, but as we head off into the world, it's not always that easy, and our levels of curiosity can certainly change over time. I'm lucky because in my work, uh, my curiosity is challenged each and every day, and that certainly is why I love doing what I do. And uh, I am so excited to hear about what the iconic Canadian actor William Shatner has to say this evening about where his curiosity has led him and the possibilities that await us if we choose to do so as well. Following the presentation by Mr. Shatner, I'm going to be sitting down over here and asking him some of your questions. Now, we had hundreds of questions submitted, and unfortunately we had to narrow it down just a little bit because otherwise Mr. Shatner would be here for another hundred years answering all the questions. So thank you all for that, uh, and we're super excited to hear what his responses will be this evening. And now... It is my honor to introduce you to the man of the hour, Mr. William Shatner. William Shatner has cultivated a career spanning over 50 years as an award-winning actor, director, producer, writer, recording artist, and horseman. He is one of Hollywood's most recognizable figures and a major philanthropist as well. His accomplishments, well, his list of accomplishments is far too long for me to get to, so I will give you the Coles notes. Not that I used those at UBC, except for maybe Dostoevsky, and I still can't even really pronounce that anyways. You will know him from such things as T.J. Hooker, Danny Crane on The Practice and Boston Legal, Rescue 911, Shatner's Raw Nerve, which is his own edgy celebrity interview series, his music... And if you haven't heard William Shatner do Iron, Ma or Iron Man by Black Sabbath, you haven't heard anything yet. And th that is your homework for this evening, kids. He has almost 30 best-selling books in both the fiction and non-fiction genres. A comic book series, William Shatner Presents. His hugely popular one-man show, Shatner's World. And a little show you might have heard of called Star Trek, where he played the role of Captain James T. Kirk. Now, something you may not know about William Shatner, he has been a successful horse breeder, a longtime dedicated breeder of the American Quarter Horses. He has had enormous success with the American Saddlebred developing and riding world champions and has won numerous world championships in several different equine events. His passion for horses and philanthropy were united when he started the Hollywood charity Horse Show, which benefits Los Angeles-based children's charities. At the tender young age of 85, he continues to act, write, produce, and direct while still making time to work with those charities and further his passion for equestrian sports. I'm just having the nerdiest moment right now. I don't know how he does it with his schedule, but I'm certainly happy that he made time for us today. Please join me in a warm UBC welcome for the man, the legend, the icon, Mr. William Shatner. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Goodness me, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. I, I, I have uh, worked uh, over the years uh, often in Vancouver. I've never been to the university. It's such a pleasure. It's a great location, a great university. You must be so proud of yourself. And, uh, and there are some wonderful people I understand here who are alumni, and we're counting on them to uh, give money, I guess. I... Uh, so I hope you'll take this in the spirit in which it's meant. You're all a little weird. <laughs> yes, even the host, Barbara Miles. Where are you, Barbara? You're weird. All right. And Fiona, you're weird too. Curious, isn't it? 
See, uh, you're weird because you're different, and you're different because you are. We are different at birth, and we proceed to be even more differentiated by the time we die. Everything colludes in making us different and unique. Everything, from the moment you are conceived, to the sounds you hear in uterus, to the pain of delivery, to the music as you are laid upon the cold basket of a weight machine, everything about nature is designed to make us different, thusly weird. Yeah, we're, we're like the snowflakes. Imagine all those billions of flakes coming down in a snowstorm. They're different. Uh, because each ice crystal forms as it falls through the layers of air. Each layer has a slightly different temperature, a little more or less water available uh, for adding to the crystal structure. Of course, if two snowflakes fell that were different, how would we know? But that's a conversation for another time. I have three children. One is tall as her mother, looks very much like her. One is the combination of my wife's mother and my mother. And the other one looks like my mother somewhat, but, uh, but not quite. She's different too. Their children sprouting the chromosomes of the parentage are just as different. Blonde hair, brown hair, red hair, athletic, intellectual, dazzling array of different characteristics. The obvious ones, the shapes of the nose, the energy level, the interests, they are obvious. You'd point to them and say, that makes the person different. But we are different in so many subtle ways. The arrangement of our brain cells, how you perceive what your senses are telling you, are different for every human being. The neurons, the dendrites, they're just different. That means that every individual will react differently, subtly or grossly to the same stimuli. Curious, isn't it? For example, I was in a play uh, for television called The Tenth Level, a dramatization of Professor Milgram's famous experiment in which he ostensibly was trying to discover whether pain induced faster learning. But in fact, his experiment was all about how far would an individual go when ordered by an authority figure to cause harm to another human being and maybe even death. So he set up his experiment thusly. In one room, a chair and a machine that sent electrical shocks to a chair in another room that could be seen through a glass panel. These shocks were 20 in number, from mildly irritating uh, 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 to, uh, to 20, which was death. Seated in the other room on the electric chair was an individual who was going to learn faster when pain was applied. In the first room with the machine, an authority figure, dressed in white with a clipboard, gave orders to a volunteer who sat in front of the machine, go to level three, go to level four, etc. In fact, the person in the other room was an actor who would scream in pretense when it supposedly got more and more uncomfortable. The real experiment was with that volunteer. How far would that volunteer go when ordered by an authority figure to press switches that went higher and higher? The dramatization was called the tenth level because after the tenth level, you were purportedly causing extreme pain. So many people went to the tenth level and beyond. In some countries, the percentage was even higher than America. What a fascinating insight into how far people will go beyond their normal state and cause pain, even death, by their actions. Some people didn't go there. See the difference? Some refused to go to that level. But how different are we? Uh, for example, studying identical and fraternal twins allows us to estimate how genes and environment interact to influence character strengths, vulnerabilities, values, in other words, everything that makes us different. There have been studies to show the differences between twins who are various different, in various different development stages, childhood, adolescent, and late adolescence. Nature versus nurture is a phrase that ensconced itself in popular language, and the whole idea came from the infamous Minnesota study of twins, identical twins, separated at birth, adopted by different families. I knew a lady 
who had given birth to twins, and she loved them very much, but at some point she couldn't afford to, to, uh, to keep them, uh, and so she put them up for adoption. One of them was adopted by a Latino family. They named him Juan. And uh, the other, uh, she was fortunate to find a lovely Muslim family who named their son Amal. And when I met the uh, birth mother, she was so proud of uh, her children. And, and she said she wanted to show me pictures. And, and so I, I looked at the face of a very handsome young boy and I said, this is a picture of Juan. And where's the picture of your other son? And she said, once you've seen Juan, you've seen them all. All right, that's a twin joke, and they're very hard to come by, all right? <laughs> I didn't know whether the audience would laugh. At that. I think, you know, a Canadian audience, you've got to be careful, you know, they're not. How important are genetics in the way a child turns out? Not all, not all identical twins are similar in personality and habits. Does it have to be nature? Or nurture, can it be both? In the age of molecular genetics, classical study is only one aspect of twins' uh, research. Molecular genetics tries to pinpoint the effects of a particular gene. There are disorder-specific vulnerabilities for conduct disorder, alcohol dependence, drug dependence, ADHD. There are genetic factors important there. The CHRM2 gene, already known to be related to sleep and stress, is associated to be known to depression in women, but not men. Self-esteem, negative emotionality, depression share some common genetic causes. Major depression and conduct disorder co-occur in adolescence at rates higher than one could be expected by chance. Studies of personality consistently attribute approximately half the variance in personality to genetic effects and the remaining variance attributed to environment. See how many things are genetically or environmentally important. Human variation takes in a wide range of possibilities that could be trivial or important, transient or permanent, voluntary or involuntary, congenital or acquired genetic or environmental. Listen to all the differences. Mutations, genetic drift, natural selection, prenatal environment, fetal programming, artificial and cultural selection, nutrition, malnutrition, quality of life and health care, pollution and toxin, education, cultural and social environment, family environment, child abuse, accidental, industrial or mutilation. Our, our, our immune system is built to recognize human differences and enforce individuality. Other differences, darker and lighter skin, thinness, fatness, differences in abilities, uh, like the ability to learn, musical aptitude, strength, endurance, agility, resilience. Here are some other differences. Asexual, bisexual, heterosexual, homosexual, pansexual, polysexual, skin or eye coloring, baldness, hirsutism, hirsutism supernumerary body parts. Try saying that three times. Shortness, dwarfism, gigantism, age, childhood, puberty, menopause. But the big one, the one that is least known, that makes such a difference in us, is gut flora. Sounds like one of those ladies dancing at a strip club in downtown uh, Vancouver. But it ain't. Gut microbiota consists of a complex community of microorganisms that live in the digestive tracts, and the gut microbiome refers to the genomes of the gut microbiota. These microorganisms are busy gleaning the energy for the fermentation of carbs, the absorption, absorption of short-chain fatty acids, they synthesize vitamin B, vitamin K, as well as metabolizing bioacids, sterols, and xenobiotics. We have a hundred trillion of these microorganisms in our intestines, ten times the number of human cells in the body. It has led some authorities to liken it as another organ, the forgotten organ. It is estimated that these gut flora have a hundred times as many genes in aggregate as there are in the human genome. Between 300 and 1,000 different species live in the gut. There's a new bacteria that they just found that is kin to blue-green algae. We have bacteria in us
that is a close rel relative to a billion-year-old cyanobacteria which helped raise the atmospheric oxygen in prehistoric years and likely led to early plant cells. We're related to plants. I wonder if we're related to marijuana. <laughs> Recent years, <clears throat> with advances in geno uh, genomic and uh, clinical studies, have created innovative uh, opportunities to tailor health care to each patient. That's the future of medicine. Each patient with their own individual needs, medicines aimed at specific ailments, treatments based on the unique physiology of each person. Not so long ago, I bought a car back east in, in the USA, and my wife and I drove across the country, and we had with us the uh, omnipresent, omniscient uh, iPhone. Now, I have seen kids mesmerized at a meal with their little phones, not contributing to the interaction of a family, totally fascinated by whatever it is they're looking at in their phones, and that's terrible. But the miracle in that phone is that it contains whole libraries of knowledge. As we swept across the country, we would ask Siri question after question. What is that? Where are we? The cause of the Civil War. On and on. Questions that would take weeks to look up if you were at a library. So long, in fact, that you'd forget the original question. <laughs> but contained... <coughs> I want you to feel sorry for... <coughs> <coughs> but contained in the palm of our hand is the total bulk of the Encyclopedia Britannica and the library in London. If we could inculcate curiosity in our students so that when they graduate, they've been tantalized by the prospect of more knowledge in their particular subjects and maybe a myriad of subjects, they could reference back to the library contained in that little phone. In your own little hand, your own library. Talk about the future of education. All right, what is the future of education? Very much like the future of medicine, tailored to the individual. Some of the answers are right here at UBC. Our current higher educational system is set up for an earlier time. When people went through 12 years of school, and if they were lucky, four years of university, students learned what their teachers and professors decided they needed to learn. Then people took a job, and most of the time they did it for the rest of their life. And this assembly line model of education doesn't fit with individual differences, individual choice, and how people's lives work now. For me, going to McGill, Generalized education didn't work at all. I skipped class. I hardly knew the inside of the classrooms. I didn't know what they were like. I didn't know what color the classrooms were. But I knew what the inside of the little broom closet-like room uh, was like. It, it, it housed the people connected to the red, white, and blue, the college musical. And that's where my interest lay. Not the accounting courses my business degree required. So I toiled Many hours working on writing, directing, acting on the musicals there, stage plays, radio plays. I barely graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce degree. But my real education, my real talents, lay in the fields where I spent most of my time. All right, all of my time. But coming out of college, I was equipped to get a, an acting job. Amen to that. Students will have more input on what they want to learn, when they want to learn, and how they want to learn it. We can expect to see more interdisciplinary and less discipline-specific programs. We will see that shorter periods of education will be mixed with shorter periods of work, and, they, and this will have many important benefits. There will be a close link of theory to practice. It will lessen the accumulation of debt. It will be easier to be flexible as interests change because the student won't be locked into a four-year degree. The pattern can be continued through life as circumstances change. It will put put more emphasis on certificates, boot camps, and intensive experiences than on degrees. The individual learning plan, where students and supportive adults chart their progress towards their goals and determine what resources and tools they need to be prepared for a successful life after graduation. Student-directed seminars slash courses. 
third and fourth year students can coordinate two seminars or courses in which they develop a course proposal, identify a faculty sponsor, take the lead in coordinating a student-directed peer learning experience driven by their personal interest. Personalized assessment options. Students choose how they will be assessed for 40% of the grade. Students work in small teams and can choose community or, or project-based learning or make a documentary video. Combine bachelor's degrees with master's of management. Students combine a bachelor's degree of their choice and take some courses that apply towards their professional master's degree as an undergraduate and then can complete their master's with a further six months of intensive study. The future of education, like medicine, will be tailored to the each individual. The bespoke university education plan, each student fit into a, a personal approach to their own education because each student is different. And I'm different too. I mean, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you if I weren't different. I, I got here in a different manner than you did. See? I boarded a shiny new, very large Bombardier airplane in Orlando, Florida, and flew up here in time to speak to you. And after I'm done here, I'm flying to Houston. I bet there are only a few of you doing that, huh? <laughs> Maybe none of you. Maybe that alone makes me unique, but that's not all. I'm a French-speaking Canadian born in Montreal, Quebec. That narrows the odds somewhat. I grew up going to public school, having to fight my way through prejudice and racism. I mean literally fight my way. My nickname was Tuffy. In grade school, I got into fights twice a day. I got interested in acting at a very early age, but I also wanted to play football. I was torn between my intellect and athleticism. It finally resolved itself in that I wasn't a good enough football player, so I gave up football at a very early age and became an actor. I was the worst student that ever went to McGill University. How apart does that set me? But I ended up with an honorary doctorate of letters. Now that's different. <laughs> I went to the Shakespeare Festival in Stratford, Ontario. Spent three years there. Even went on as an understudy. Then I was able to get to New York and did leading roles in live television. Then I hung around Los Angeles and Hollywood because they hadn't seen a young actor with the amount of stage experience that I had acquired in Canada. I was different and they hired me and happened to be in the right place at the right time and Star Trek happened and by that time I was evidently different from other young actors and good things happened and that's the way that went. Due to what I was as an individual allowed me to gain some success in the entertainment industry. American Wrench and I designed a motorcycle and I decided I would drive it from Chicago to Los Angeles about 2400 miles. I was curious about what that would be like. I didn't fully comprehend the enormity of what I let myself in for. But that eight-day trip, shooting a documentary that I call The Ride, raising funds for the American Legion for their scholarship fund, and trying to promote the bike all at the same time while driving 12 hours a day on a motorcycle. Now that sounds pretty different, doesn't it? And by the way, the daily ride of 12 hours with trucks coming at you and cars passing you so that you felt your life jeopardized, honed my sensitivity to the world around me. The more I thought I was going to die, the more aware I became of the beauty of life around me, the smell of the air, the thrum of the wind, the sound of the motor, and life that flowed by on both sides. It was a life-changing experience and unique to me. We're also spiritually different. We believe different things. People like Donald Trump believe one thing, most of us believe another. <laughs> Once you've seen Juan, you've seen them all. <laughs> For me, my spiritual turning point came at 17,000 feet in the Himalayas. I was there shooting some film at the foot hill of Mount Everest at the spiritual confluence of several mountains, a holy site according to Buddhism, and where you would gain spiritual knowledge, enlightenment. And I took that very seriously. So instead of going in, into the bare bones building where we were housed, I took my sleeping bag and slept outside in the below freezing weather. The stillness, 
was palpable. Not a sound from anything living. There were no birds, no animals, no motors, no engines, no telephones, just the mountains towering above me and the stars and the constant wind. I'm ready now, I thought. I'm ready to be fulfilled and gain spiritual equanimity that I could never find. So I waited and was receptive. Seven days, seven nights, nothing. No golden glow in the pit of my stomach, no holy buzz deep inside my head, just the wind and the cold. On the seventh day, I gathered up my sleeping bag at dawn, preparing now to hike back down to civilization, and suddenly the moment of illumination occurred. To achieve spiritual illumination, you don't need to be in the confluence of holy mountains. You don't need to suffer physical deprivation. You don't need to be miserable. You don't need drugs. The spirituality can come at any time, at any moment, anywhere. It can be in the middle of the ocean or on top of a skyscraper, anywhere any place. You leave yourself open to the idea that enlightenment is a series of steps. You have to be constantly sensitive to the world around you, the flow of ideas, and the creativity inside of you. A sense of awe you need, of how curious nature is, how different. Focusing on a grain of sand is just as useful as focusing on a holy relic. It's all inside your head. Does that make me different? When did a French-speaking English Canadian who went to Stratford, Ontario, who made a lot of mistakes on live television, who still has his Canadian passport and is living in the States and still remembers the glory days of the Canadian hockey team, <laughs> who fits that profile but me? I'm your snowflake. So being different and weird also applies to our curiosity. The diversity that greets us every day, from the sunlight to what you taste and eat and think, the panoply of things that assail us in our life, all causes for curiosity and interest. What was that epiphany? Who had that new idea? Concepts we haven't heard before, asking the question and then miraculously finding the answer leads us down a maze of questions and answers that should be our life. Questions and answers and questioning the answers. Our diversity is our snowflake. And millions and millions of diverse flakes fall, rise up and fall again. And a giant snowbank with mystery and opportunity, that's our humanity. The individuality of that frozen water is akin to the uniqueness of every individual. We should honor it, appreciate it, and then find kinship with the rest of those weird and wonderful flakes. Thank you very much. You. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Shatner. Am I right there? We're going to go over here. Well, thank you, Mr. Shatner, for that wonderful talk, and thank you for being our little Canadian snowflake. I'm a little snowflake. <laughs> and, of course, uh, we had hundreds of questions submitted. Hundreds? To you. Hundreds and hundreds. I've got three answers. <laughs> yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> is this on? Am I, uh, are you hearing We're on. Me? Yeah. Can you hear them, everybody? Okay. Okay, so why do you think it's so important to be curious? Well, <laughs> I'm curious to why I'm coughing. Um, uh, we're born uh, with curiosity. We emerge uh, stumbling out of the uh, womb, and, uh, and we're immediately grasping as soon as the eyes open and we're looking and we're feeling and the world around us. We're trying to read through our senses that slowly come alive. And then we make tools to explore even further. And I was in the uh, uh, lunar module uh, before it went to the moon. And uh, it was the most complex tool uh, that man has ever invented, apparently. And I was inside it. And then we went to the moon. Why? Because we were curious. And now space invites us 
And the question always is, why should we go there? And the answer is because we're curious. Very nice. Okay. Now you talked about the iPhone in your talk and the great things about it. The fact that we have all of this at our fingertips is absolutely incredible. But one of our questions is, in your opinion, does the Internet make us more or less curious? And how will it, the Internet, uh, shape future generations? I don't know. <laughs> Good answer. <coughs> this curiosity thing is a double-edged sword. Um, we're curious about how to make a bomb, and we're curious about how to solve uh, uh, disease. Um, we are a complex animal with a reptilian inner brain and a somewhere in our large uh, brain, the frontal lobe, I think. Uh, we try and control all that, and we fight for control of our uh, our, our, our ability to do uh, uh, doomsday things and magnificent things. There's a young lady in the audience here I was just reading before I came on who has discovered a new planet, a warm Neptune. Uh, not that I thought Neptune was particularly cold, but she's discovered her curiosity. She went through new data, uh, old data, with a new eye. She's a graduate student here at UCB. And she took all this NASA data that had been gone over time and time again, and she found four, I believe, planets, but this new Neptune. I mean, it's incredible. The human animal is so complex, it's so awesome, and we're fighting for our existence right now, led by, I would like to think, led by Canada, so that we're aware of the, the terrible harm we're doing to the planet, our ability not to harm the planet. We're torn between those, those, da those, those uh, uh, different posts. The decisions we make today will... Are, are, are epic. They will be the difference between life on earth with human beings because the earth will continue. There's this wonderful theory of Gaia, Mother Earth, upon which we're living. And the earth has, uh, the planet itself has many attributes of life. Here's the mysterious thing. They th theorize that Mars losing its water, all the salts uh, are on, on the surface from the evaporated water. The salts of billions of years of water. Our oceans have had the same salinity for eons. Did you know that? I just learned that right now. So why, why wouldn't it be more and more salty as the sun evaporates the ocean and there's no place else for the water to go, the evaporation rises, the rains fall, and there's this cycle, and, and the salts remain. Where do they go? How does the earth maintain its equanimity in salts, to name other things, oxygen too? How? They've recently discovered the possible answer, that with the ebb and flow of the oceans, the salt is laid down in banks, then tectonic plates work, and the salt either disappears or goes under the earth, the water comes back, and the salt is lost while new salts come into the ocean. And there's this balance. The earth is taking care of itself. It's called the Gaia theory. It may or not may not be real, but what a wonderful concept it is for the earth needing our help. The earth has always helped mankind. Now mankind needs to help the earth. Okay, who needs Siri when you've got William Shatner? Come on. Okay, our next question is, what most valued opportunities beyond stage or screen has acting opened up to you? Horses. 
How so? Through acting? No, no, you can't act a horse. You've got to get on a horse. <laughs> I, over the years, uh, I developed a love of horses. And, you know, I miss my family. I miss my wife. I miss my dogs. I miss my home when I'm traveling. And I've had, I've been traveling for about three weeks now. But I also miss my horses. Um, uh, just in passing, I have a charity event I put on every year, which I have for the last 30 years. And the horses, uh, it's a horse event, and every penny that goes to this charity, and I've been able to use the celebrity that you've given me uh, to raise funds for uh, children and, uh, and uh, veterans using hippotherapy, horse therapy. And the theory is that horses being a herd animal have to be alive in the present. They can't be thinking about the great pasture they had yesterday. And they can't be thinking about tomorrow when the predators are coming. They have to be in the moment. And being in that moment is what they teach all these people who need help physically, emotionally, uh, physically. Horses are extraordinary animals, and I've gotten to have, I feel, I've gotten to have a spiritual connection with animals. We're all electrical beings giving off electrical vibrations, if you will. And I'm fascinated by the fact that a telephone uh, post in, in sending off millions of signals every day Every so often our phone rings, and it's from the, it's found us. It's, it's vibrating on, our, uh, on that frequency. Why doesn't the universe, why is it beyond the concept that the universe sends out signals, and every so often it rings our bell? And what we think of as coincidences is the, is the universe finding us. And, and, and uh, directing us. If we're sensitive to that, and horses seem to have that sensitivity, if we're sensitive to those directions, whether they come from the universe or come from inside ourselves, whatever fits your fancy, if we're sensitive to that, we become so much aware, and then I'm back to the curiosity, the questions then, although not answered, the questions become more profound. What is, aside from horses, the craziest adventure or opportunity you're glad you took up or wish you hadn't, and why? Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. <laughs> Do they teach that here at UBC? <laughs> Should we just leave that alone? You want no, to elaborate well, on that I, I one? I can explain a little bit. <laughs> So uh, when I was shooting Star Trek, a record company asked me to, um, to do an album, and I had a great concept. I thought if I put um, great literature, uh, great monologues uh, with music underneath and segued into a song of the time, that uh, it would be interesting. And the song had the... Uh, uh, the same or the opposite philosophy, to be or not to be, segued into, it was a very good year. A man who wanted to live is against to die or not to die. Um, and so I did uh, Cyrano de Bergerac. The, the last speech ends, I may climb to no great heights, but I will climb alone. And it's segued into a song, a drug song, where the individual can't do it alone. Uh, LST, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I was performing it on the Johnny Carson show when I, uh, both cuts and the producer said, that's too long. Choose one or the other. I chose the song and without any explanation, I'm doing Lucy in the Sky like a drug. And, uh, <laughs> and that's what happened. And the rest is history. <laughs> okay.
Who was the most influential person to you in your formative years, and how did they help shape who you are today? You know, I've often thought about that, about heroes and, and mentors, and, and I've come to the conclusion I had none of those. I never got any help from, you know, I mean, my parents, but they didn't help. I mean, they gave me birth and gave me an education and loved me. But, I mean, like, here's a hand, son, and, and here's a, an opportunity. None of that ever happened. I struggled uh, through university and, and, and found uh, I was able to work in summer theater and at Stratford for three or four years, three years. And then I got to New York and, uh, and it was by doing things, by performing. But nobody substantial ever said, uh, you're young and, and, uh, and you've got promise and here's something you should... I never got a hand up. It was always me struggling to do it. It's been a long uh, slow ride. I've often looked at these young actors who get on a television show and they become overnight successes and wow, that, that was great. But even prior to Star Trek, uh, which you could say was the thing that brought me to the public's attention, even prior to S uh, Star Trek I was starring in movies and starring in Broadway and I was making a career uh, so I don't know where it would have gone. God bless Star Trek, but uh, uh, maybe that's the one thing I could point to as the helping hand, but, but even that I had to work for. So no, I never had a mentor or somebody who I could identify and said, here's a helping hand. You were talking about uh, acting at Stratford, and, and obviously you've been an actor for a very long time. Who do you consider to be one of our greatest living actors, male or female, in the world today? Here's my problem. <laughs> Sit back. Uh, my problem is... I don't go to movies. I watch them at home. I get from, I'm a member of the uh, academy, the film academy, so I get these discs. And I've got a wonderful projection thing at home, and so I play the movies at home when I get around to it. I don't watch hourly television. I watch movies on television, sports, news. I'm a newsaholic. So I don't know anybody. Are you still a Habs fan? Yes. Where are they now? <laughs> That's a good question. Are the playoffs they're no, still they're on? They're nowhere, right? Uh, ever since uh, Maurice Richard retired, I... Um, so I, I don't know people. I mean, I, I, I see some movies and I think they're brilliant. You know, uh, then I forget the name of them and I, I feel stupid. You know the one with the, where the birds flew and the guy was on the back of the bird? And, um, Never ending story? Was that a bird? I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know anybody that you could say this is a great actor, although they abound and they're wonderful. There's some wonderful talents out there now and wonderful directorial talents. And I don't know anybody's name. And, and I'm somewhat embarrassed, but not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> All right. We know you guys want some Star Trek questions, right? This is a good one, actually. Star Trek writers and producers were early pioneers in the movie industry in pushing the boundaries to uncover social and moral issues during its times such as gender equality, human and alien rights, and discrimination. <coughs> At the time, did you recognize how Star Trek was pushing all of those boundaries? No, the only thing Star Trek did for me was push my buttons. <laughs> I'm trying to be funny, and that wasn't really funny, you notice that... <laughs> Uh, yeah, now it is. <laughs> yes, uh, I was a, a fan of uh, science fiction uh, before doing Star Trek. You know, science fiction is a really... Uh, I, I, I wrote a book uh, called Get a Life about who, you know, uh, who, who comes to uh, the, these um, 
uh, these conventions and who subscribes. <laughs> well, you can laugh, but there have been some interesting... Uh, in, in doing due diligence for the book, I, I talked to a lot of people. I did a lot of uh, research. I, I mean, I, I talked to a young man who's, um, who was shy to the point of being uh, 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 crazy. I mean, he was pathological. A pathological shyness. He couldn't talk. He couldn't. Don't even look at me. But when he had his cat dressed up as the captain. Was the cat or was he dressed as the captain? No. When he had the cat dressed up in the little yellow shirt and the thing. He was as verbal and as voluble as anybody. I talked to a lady who had multiple personalities. All of them Star Trek. Uh, the voice of she she even had my voice. I thought she did a terrible imitation uh, of it. So that was the explanation of uh, of what I uh, arrived at at the book. That they came to see each other, talk to each other. People found uh, a a mutuality uh, of their love for Star Trek, and they would come to these conventions. I then did a documentary on it, called it the same thing: Get a Life. And where I delved more deeply into it, somehow I, I lapsed into the ability to be more curious and have the opportunity to find more people. And I discovered an answer to science fiction that really appeals to me. And, and, and I, I bring that to your question now, the, an, the answer to your question, which is science fiction is mythological. It seeks to explain the inexplicable. What's that UFO? You know, is, that, is that thing flying around? Has it got little green men in it? Well, apparently it hasn't. But the whole idea of time travel and, and warm Neptune, who's swimming in warm Neptune? Or apparently Neptune, warm Neptune has a moon. And maybe there's life there, and it's only 2,300 light years away so it would only take us at the speed of light 2300 years can you imagine making a voyage that would take you if you could go at the speed of light 2300 years when we can't even remember what our direction is after four years of, uh, of policies you know we forget everything I mean a hundred years ago, we don't remember what the direction of Canada was supposed to be. We were supposed to be the, the nation for wildlife. We were going to save the world. We were going to, uh, the salmon were going to be healthy and the, and the land. And, and, and we're mining oil from the sands and, and ruining Alberta. Alberta's burning up. Have they put the fire out yet? Have they? No, seriously. They have put it out? Okay. God Almighty. So, how can you expect to remember where you were going for 2,300 years? Oh, we're going to that small planet around the warm Neptune. But it's the speed of light. And why do you slow down at the speed of light? And what is time? There, there are astrophysicists in the, in the audience. What is time-space continuum? I mean, if a photon of light leaves 13 and a half billion years from that galaxy on the edge of the universe and takes that length of time to reach my eye, that's a passage of time. Where, what is this space-time shit? <laughs> I'm also a Luddite. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if anybody knows the answer to that question in 140 characters, please tweet, tweet yeah, it right. to at William Shatner. Okay, so we have a question here uh, from someone who watched Star Trek as a teenager and it inspired them to become a professor right here at UBC. How do you think Star Trek changed people's lives, aside from the cat guy? <coughs> so I had an idea to do a documentary. 
in which I thought I would examine all the actors who played captains of the starship. And I needed to interview them, and they were all spotted across the world. I needed an airplane. And the price of the, of the travel in itself was more money than I had to make the documentary. So I called Bombardier. Oh, no, you don't dial like that anymore. I'm like, what is he doing? Uh, old habits die hard, you know what I mean? And, and the phone rings, and the telephone operator gets on there, and they, eh, Bombardier. And I said, can I speak to the chairman? But yeah, boom. Uh, can I speak? Apparently he's got an operator. Oh, they don't do that anymore? I don't know. So they press another button. Who? Uh, how does that button get to that thing? I know how that works, but how does that work? I, so the secretary answers the CEO's office. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm William Shatner. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, is the is the president in? Yes. Hold on a minute. President gets on. Yes. Mr. Shatner. Yeah. What can I do for you? Well, here's my problem. I got to do this, and then I need an airplane. He says, no problem, I'll lend you one. <laughs> and he lends me an airplane, a Bombardier 6000, flies me from Los Angeles to, to Toronto, where I pick up the crew and the camera, and he comes on the tarmac. I meet him. Lovely man. And he says, the reason I'm lending you this airplane is because of your show, me, he said, you inspired me to become an aeronautical engineer. As a result of being an aeronautical engineer, I'm head of Bombardier. And I'd like to repay my debt. And here's the airplane. Nice. Okay. Favorite outtake or blooper from Star Trek? I hate it. <laughs> <coughs> I hated those blooper reels. <laughs> they're, they're for these, those of you who don't know, that we, I, I would play the fool quite often. You don't see that here, but... <laughs> but I would joke around in 14 hours a day on the set. You get a little loony, and, you know, I'd crash into doors and, and um, not lower the shields or, or, or not raise the shields. Or, Lower the shields. Oh, we're dead. Um, <laughs> so, at a Christmas party, all the editors would put together about 20 minutes of footage, and all the silliness that we indulged in as actors, uh, we enjoyed. For two Christmases, we were on the air for three years. So we had 40 minutes. When I'm asked, when did I realize that Star Trek was going to be a success? I was skiing, I think, in mont or something. It was something Canadian. It was Whistler. I was Whistler. Good answer. And uh, Whistler. I was at Whistler when the oil company bought Whistler. I don't know whether they still have it or not. But I was at Whistler when the head of the oil company were having a party at the halfway house and and they were shifting everybody up to the halfway house in the gondola and they put the head of the the man who bought Whistler for, from Canada the United States okay at that time I believe it was the United States oil company and the head guy who had bought this Canadian gem from Canada went up in a gondola nobody he never said that he had uh, claustrophobia he was on the floor of the gondola, the gondola, when it opened at the halfway house, screaming, writhing, sweat. Come. This was the guy who bought our whistle. <laughs> what was your question? Karma. I can't remember. <laughs> your favorite outtake or blooper? Bloopers. So, <laughs> so somebody comes up to me, and I'm skiing, and they said, did you see... The blooper, uh, what are you talking about? Those are Christmas reels just designed for, well, they're playing at a local bar. I went down there 
and they were playing the bloopers. Like, and everybody's laughing and being entertained. And a show that had been canceled two, three years. Like, you know, it would be like you and I in this wonderful interview you're conducting. Being held up 50 years from now as the example of how to conduct an interview. That's how outlandish it was to me. If I were smarter, I'd be 50 years offended. later, we would be talking about Star Trek. That's... Good Lord. Good Lord. He won't help. <laughs> okay. A little bit more of a serious question. You recently published a book about your 50-year friendship with Leonard Nimoy. Yes. What is, I'm sure this is hard to pinpoint, what is your favorite memory of the late and great Leonard Nimoy? My book, Leonard, which is out there now, is about our friendship. You know, I, I think for reasons, cultural, I suppose, maybe partially nature and nurture, men find it more difficult to make friends. I, I, that's my belief. It may or may not be true. Certainly in my case, it was hard for me to make friends as I, as I pummeled my way through school and, and then struggled my way in career and was always striving to, you know, to put the food in my children's mouth and, and mine. And, um, and so friends, for the deep brotherly love friendship that one reads about, that I read about, I thought, God, I, I've never felt that. Towards a woman I was married to, yes, but not this... Let's go have a beer and talk about life friendship. I found that with Leonard. <clears throat> Usually, in, a, in show business, whether it's a movie or a series or a play, the event lasts a certain amount of time. Weeks, months, maybe even years. But at some point it's over. And the people who with whom you fought that war against management of bad scripts, late hours, fatigue. You bonded together like a, like a squad of soldiers. Leonard and I had that. And you form really, based on that, you form really deep friendships. But then, when the event is over, when that thing is over, everybody goes on their different ways. James Spader and I did a series called Boston Legal. Five years. <clears throat> I loved and love James Spader. Since the day the show is canceled, I've not seen or heard. I heard, we, we talked twice on the phone uh, some years ago. Oh, we've not seen each other. We're just, things just get away from you. But with Leonard, because we were doing movies, and doing appearances on stage, we were in each other's company. And we had so much in common, background, foreground, uh, career, uh, personal lives, professional lives. We had so much in common, we were, we were the best of friends. He helped me through death and, and grief, and, and, uh, and I, the same with the divorce. We were w w wonderful friends. So my book is about friendship. And... Uh, how difficult it is to make and even more importantly sustain a friendship and I use Leonard Nimoy as an example. Wonderful, thank you. Do you still consider yourself Canadian? You mentioned uh, having a Canadian passport still, but would you ever move back here do you think? <coughs> Can I come here? I mean, prices of houses are so high. Uh, I used to come to Vancouver, and you could buy one of these houses along here for fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars. Lord Almighty! Um, I love Canada. Uh, there's a breath of freshness. How about Justin Trudeau? Come on! And he's beautiful. 
What a, what a, we should fly him from a flagpole, he's so beautiful. <laughs> he should be the emblem of Canada blowing the wind. He and his wife and his kid, you know? I mean, Kennedy was great, but this guy, is he doing good things? The word desultory occurs to me here. Uh, there was a, like a smattering of applause. As Justin Trudeau, he was elected on a popular vote because of, of Pierre, right? Right? There's consternation reigns in the audience, but, but is that true? I mean, he, his reputation, based on his father's I mean, the genes are there. And the environment. So you got perfect genes. I was just talking about it. Nature and nurture are working hand in glove with Justin Trudeau. He should be one of the great leaders of Canada. You're silent there. <laughs> I may be barking up the wrong tree here. I may lose my Canadian citizenship. Uh, so I have my Canadian passport, and would I move back here? Absolutely. If they kick me out of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay, of your successful six-decade career, is there a performance or favorite role that has stood out to you beyond all others? Well, I, I mostly do moments like, did I hit the moment? Um, uh, but I'm doing a one-man show. I did it on Broadway. I've been touring on it. I, uh, I came through Vancouver some time ago, a few years ago, with a version of it. But the Broadway version is far superior. I perfected it and then rewrote it when I got to New York. And, and so it was very successful and successful on tour. It's a personal show, talk about things, not unlike what we're doing here. Uh, I do it alone, of course. I, unfortunately, you're not with me. You play your cards right. I um, I can get on that Bombardier. You can get on that Bombardier. <laughs> um, but that one-man show, to entertain an audience for two hours alone, without dancing girls or music or anything like that, that's a feat. That's like the high jump of uh, entertainment. And so when I do it, it's such a personal thing, and, it's, and the moment... I come out and the affection from the audience and when I leave more importantly there's still that affection <laughs> I uh, I think perhaps that may be at least one of the highlights of my professional life you have accomplished so many things in so many different fields what still remains on William Shatner's bucket list everything I, I, you know, I'm an old man. Jeez, I can't believe it. When I hear my age, it's like, what? <laughs> and, and, and then I look up at a television screen with my image on it. Who's that? <laughs> but there's so much. Like, when I, 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 I leave here in a couple of hours, and I get them back on that Bombardier airplane, and I go to Houston. And I work all day tomorrow in Houston, uh, personal appearance. Then, I fly commercial. Oh. <laughs> Back to Los Angeles, where my horse show begins, and I compete as a rainer, and I'm too tired to explain what raining is. Uh, so I compete in my own horse show, which has been going on for 30 years. We raise about... Four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars every year for thirty years. We've raised ten to fifteen million dollars over the years for children and and um, and veterans. So, what remains? What I'd like to do is I've I've won. I I I'm able to win. I've gotten good enough where a hundred people will be competing in the same class, and I can beat them if I'm not too tired. Because what happens when you're older is when you get a little tired. You know how you can't think of the name? Uh, I'd like you to meet my wife. <laughs> no, that's not a good one. So uh, sometimes in the pattern, because you're doing all kinds of complicated patterns, uh, where the heck am I? 
Not a good thing to win. But when that doesn't happen, I have a chance at winning. That's how good I've gotten. Excellent. Okay. We only, sadly, have time for one more question. So, Mr. Shatner. Yes. If you were to go back in time and meet your younger self, oh. what one piece of advice would you offer you? Don't marry that girl. Listen, I am so blessed being here tonight in front of you, healthy except for the remnants of a slight cold, but it, you know, how when, when, when it just catches in your throat and you can't get rid of it. I am so blessed with my health, with the love around me by my family and, and friends, by being able to address an audience with the same energy and vigor I've always had. To be able to entertain you, to be able to go someplace, and enter, to be s still performing and uh, being relevant. And although that is the operator thing, <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did just come back from Italy, and I'm sure they do that in Italy. <laughs> but I feel so blessed that to think that I would change anything that preceded this, to this is the apotheosis of my life and I'm so glad to be here and to and to be with you and I wouldn't change a thing thank you so much ladies and gentlemen mr. William Shatner thank you you can find tonight Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for coming. You can find tonight's talk. It's going to be posted online at alumni.ubc.ca. And good night, everyone. Live long and prosper.